Hello, Jeff. Hello, Jeff. <laughs> How is it? Like magic. What's that? Like magic. I know. You're <laughs> you know, you know what is? Hmm? A Jeff on Jeff. We could both be coming out to like the, the, the sound of like the Rocky soundtrack, couldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. How you been? I've been not too bad, actually, surprisingly, given given like um, the state, given the state of things at the moment. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm a bit tired because I was staying up late last night because I, I was watching too many gig streams, basically. What did you um, see last night? Uh, well, I was watching Phoebe Bridges and Phineas uh, uh, Irish, um, who's Billy Irish's brother. Okay. Uh, and actually, his set was actually really quite interesting. Okay. Of, um, he kept on changing the colours for every single one of his songs. Right. Because he has synesthesia, so he's like, right, okay, I'll change the colour of my of my studio for every single one of every single <laughs> one of these. He had like special like light box design for him. Right. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So it's like kind of each one of the songs is like a different emotion sort of thing. Great. Uh, Great. Yeah. Good songs. Yeah, I like them. Actually, I think they they I think they. He's definitely one of those kind of interesting kind of pop song producers, really. Because mm -hmm. you forget that he writes a lot of the stuff for Billie Eilish, sort of thing. Yeah. Because um, he, produ he produces her records, I think, doesn't he? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, they definitely do them in like the vein, like for, especially for the pop world, in quite a DIY sense, as if in like they, they recorded mm -hmm. actually in his bedroom. Mm -hmm. Sort of thing. Have you, been, have you been watching a lot of gigs on, uh, online then? Yeah. Right. That's the thing is that pretty much every day it's almost like keeping up my gig diet, but like <laughs> kind of like an online online, online variation. <laughs> and 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 are are are, are, are they sat, are they are they satisfying? I, I mean, I, I I saw. I haven't seen anything particularly fancy. I watched the sort of simple stuff like when Sea Change went online, which yeah. um, which I, I like. Well. I've been enjoying watching Katie Pearson do her Saturday night, Friday, uh, her um, Saturday night. Things from home, yeah. but um, I, I must admit I am quite looking forward to when the restrictions get a get a little eased when people can be in the room together. Go be well. There's the going in the room together bit, but I'm I'm seeing that as still being a little bit, a little bit of a little bit far away. Yeah. But just when 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 enough when the numbers can when the numbers can add up to a band and then they can go into a room somewhere, yeah. plug in. And somebody can film it, so we can get this. You know, we can get something closer to the live experience uh, uh, in our own home. Yeah, I know that they've been doing that in America. So, like, on um, because like the other night I was watching Clutch, as if in like the, the kind of the Dean metal band, and like they, so they had like there's them and Crowbar and um, a couple of other bands who are all performing in their own studios. Oh, okay. So they're doing, they're doing like the, 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 the usual kind of like live set, but like, right. you know. Yeah, that's what I'm waiting for here. We've been trying yeah. to, so Heaven, Heaven is 30 this year. Yeah, and, right. Um, well, firstly, uh, that would be said really well done for, for, thank you. for, for, for standing 30 years. I know. Well, it's not just me. You know, I'll, I'll take your thanks and appreciate them massively, but I, I just, I was the guy, I just happened to be the guy that's, Started, you know, <laughs> um, you know, you, you've met everybody that lives the dream alongside me, and um, and okay. you, you know how passionate everybody is. So it, it, it's total teamwork, but yeah, it's been very it. disappointing. You know, like, but, but sometimes it needs like a little spark to start that. Like, to be honest, it doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, when I started it, funny enough, are you, are you at home in Bristol? Yeah, I am. Um, it was it, it was it was because of a Bristolian. Actually, he wasn't a Bristolian. He lived in Bristol. Uh, it was a Brist, it was a Bristol fella that that actually lit the fuse to, that, that 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 made me start heavenly. It's a chap called Mike Chadwick. Uh -huh. and long ago, up on the up on the Triangle, there used to be yeah. a record shop called Revolver. Did you yeah. were you in Bristol when that was there? Yeah, no, I remember Revolver just about. I was I was okay. I'd been like kind of tail end of. Evolve, because I would have moved in around about 2002-ish. Okay. So I would have okay. been like the tail end of Evolve. I, I, was, Evolve I was there before. almost 20 years before you, Jeff. I, got, I, my, I managed that shop for one year. Wow. Uh, 1983 into 84. 
Wow. Yeah. I was the manager of that shop and that shop was great. That shop was very, very busy shop. And it was also an, a, a fantastic year for the music culture that that shop propagated. So mm. it was the year. So Revolver, the shop had a back room, which was Revolver Distribution. And that wow. was, yeah, that was, that would sell all the independent label releases to the Southwest of England and South Wales. Uh, as part of a network called the cartel, which was yeah. a network of mostly shops who set up distributions to service their regions. Mm. And I used to work in the HMV shop in Plymouth and I used to buy from Revolver wow. in Bristol. And this chap, Mike Chadwick, he was the shop manager. And one day Mike decided that he was going to leave the shop, but buy into the distribution side of the business. Mm. And the guy that ran that was called Lloyd Harris. He was a Bristol fella, very nice yeah. man. As was Mike, um, as is Mike. Um, and Lloyd said to Mike, well, there's the person we need to get to, to, to replace you is in the HMV shop in Plymouth. And, um, yeah. and he buys far too many records from us, but sells them all. Yeah. And uh, so I got, called, got a call and I went up and had this interview and I took Mike's job there. Um, which was great because for a music nut like me, yeah. having this distribution room next door got me even closer. I mean, it's an elitist job, this, because yeah. the reason I got, wanted to work in a record shop in the first place, before the label, was just so I could get my hand on records before anybody else. Come on, why would you, you like, not want to, like, kind of work in a record shop? Because you would literally get the first, yeah. the first pressings and you get, like, not just that, but also you get, like, probably a whole lot of other rarities which no one would ever yeah have ever come across and like and that sort of thing that's that that's exactly why whether as a kid i just wanted to work in record shops i wanted to get that so when i had this distribution room uh, uh, as an add-on to the shop i was even closer to the source i was getting white labels wow. <laughs> yeah. so the natural you know eventually one day i guess i was going to start this label but yeah. Mike Chadwick, going back to that chap, so I'd be, uh, Mike was a very nice man. I enjoyed working for Mike at Revolver, but I only did it for a year. I, 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 missed, I actually missed Plymouth. I, 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 yeah. I had a girlfriend down there and I missed my friend. So I'd, I'd close up, I'd shut up shop in Bristol on a Saturday night and get the train back to Plymouth for a night out, yeah. go back on um, Monday morning. But um, so it only lasted a year. Well, that year was great because the yeah. Smith's debut record came out. Um, you know, and it was a big indie store, but it was also a big reggae store. And, and the Wild Bunch guys, Nelly yeah. and Grant, were doing the dugout club. So they were buying electro records for like, like, wow. like, the, like the foundings for like trip hop and for like yeah. lots of like the kind of uh, like post punk sort of stuff as yeah. well. Totally that. Like, I mean, yeah, but also that Bristol was a massive hotbed for a lot of the post punk movement. Yeah, oh God, yeah. I mean, the pop group were uh, a revelation. Yeah. You know, without the pop group, we'd have had no certain ratio, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. Very important group. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, so, so, so I was down in Bristol for, for a year working with those guys. And then several years later, later, before I did Heavenly, I actually did a couple of labels, smaller labels. I did one called Head. I put out the first records by Loop. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I did their, uh, and, and when James Endicott was actually a member as well. It, wow. Yeah, it first was started. Time you know, the first time you know, you know James Endicott is free. Well, the first time I met James was actually in 1980, very early 85. It was either end of 84 or early 85. He was a student at um, college in Dartmouth. Wow. And I was working in a record shop in Plymouth at the time in the city centre called Meet Whiplash. Yeah. And it was down on, down, you're from Plymouth, aren't you, Jeff? Um, well, my parents are, are, are li like going to live in Plymouth and my sister does, but I've, I, 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 I've, I've got a weird wayward history, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> no, so I was well, we were down, our shop was down near the market and yeah. the indoor market in Frankfurt Gate, and it was a great shop. It was as freaky as, you know, the name suggests, I guess. I mean, it was named after a song by the Fire Engines. Yeah. And, um, and it was just a fucking great alternative record shop. You know, it was, um, uh, some people tell me they were scared to go in, but I mean, if you were a music lover, I mean, man, yeah, you, know, 
you go across that, you go through that door. You see no, my window no. and you're going, I'm going in. I'm going to find someone in there, a, 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 a soul friend, you know, I'm soulmate. Yeah. We were, well, we're a good shot. Like, like so me, whenever I see a box of records, I'm like, let's have a quick flick through here. Yeah, totally that. You, you, but, just, you never lose <laughs> the sense, though, do you? No. You know, well, James did that one day. He came in to meet Whiplash. He came to Plymouth shopping. I think he needed to buy some socks. And he came to Plymouth from college, from Dartmouth, and saw this shop and thought, I'm going in there. And I'll never forget this. I remember seeing him for the first time. He, I was leaning on the counter. It was a Saturday morning. I was, I was hung over. And I was leaning on the counter. And I saw this guy staring in disbelief around this shop. He was looking at the walls. There were Stooges posters on the walls. There were posters wow. of the Velvets and... And, and and Alex Chilton and and you know these great rock and roll icons. Well, so, um, I suppose it was, it was like in the period when also when they weren't necessarily always iconic either, or they no, weren't always you know like seen yeah. as like the great icons that they are now. Uh, no, it, it was weird, you know. <laughs> 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 and of course, James, um, being suitably weird, loved it. And he yeah. was flicking through, you know, these records and was pulling out these Australian imports by groups that were Triffids, whose records were only available in import at the time, yeah. but very hard to find. Boys Next Door, right, the early birthday party, pre-birthday party, um, Roland Howard and Nick Cave's group. Mm. And he couldn't believe this stuff. So that was the time I met him, because he turned around to me, and he looked at me and said, what the fuck are you doing here? Not meaning, <laughs> me personally, meaning, <laughs> meaning this shop in Plymouth. Yeah. And I said, yeah, he would blew his mind. He goes, oh, what the fuck? And, yeah. and then he noticed behind my head, there was a poster on the, on the back wall for a, a Jesus and Mary Chain gig, which was taking place uh, early February, mm. 85, uh, at a small club in Plymouth, um, just off of Union Street. I, it was a gig I put on. Yeah, oh, he, wow. He pointed at that poster and he said, and now you're really taking the fucking piss. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then it, a few years later, I bumped into him at a gig in London, yeah. and I'd started working with Loop, and we'd been talking about having a, a fourth member, just for, more for look and balance than necessarily any virtuoso player, which is, yeah. of, course he, of course he wasn't, you know. But, right. but he looked fantastic, he still looks fantastic, and he is fantastic. So I remember approaching him at his gig saying, he said, you're that guy from the record shop. I said, I am. How are you? Do you want to join a band? <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think that's a question which I think any and which a lot of probably music nerds have probably reacted by going fuck yes yeah totally you know, I think there, there's definitely there, there's like I mean even I've occasionally had those kind of ambitions where I've been like wow what what would happen if how cool would it, would it be if I put out my own record or if I put my own artwork on a record sort of yeah. thing yeah so I think, yeah so I think also a lot for me with a lot of records I've also found myself sometimes buying because of the artwork. Uh-huh. Yeah. Sometimes you pick them up and go like, that looks really cool. Yeah. And yeah. like sometimes if it looks really cool, then it's generally there's gonna be like kind of at least gonna be at least half interesting sounding record. Yeah. Very, very it's very important. And if you do get it home and the record's rubbish, you just throw the record away and put the picture on the wall. Yeah, exactly. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or, or 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 you just like store it in a bin somewhere which like with the like kind of like it, like it, it can be a Christmas Jordan. gift. It can be a Christmas gift. Sorry, the sleeve, you don't get the sleeve with this gift. <laughs> exactly. um, the, <laughs> the, um, but those things are clues, aren't they? They're very important, you know, and, 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 and I think you've got, I, I'd like to think that we, we have good artwork on Heavenly Records, but, but, but we've had some labels. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is obviously 4AD, who used to have a, you know, an in-house designer, yeah. and the artwork was always... Um, his representation, Vaughan Oliver's representation of yeah. what the group sounded like rather than the group identity. I, I've never felt that I could do that. I always feel that with the groups that we sign, mm. the groups we work with, I always feel that they probably, it's important for them to, 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 to create, yeah. create the artwork. We can help them. Yeah. Um, and Danny does all the time. Mm. Um, but rather than take it out of their hands completely. I worked for Factory for a short while in the, in the late 80s. Um, oh, wow. uh, for about four years. Yeah, I did. I was, their, I was their press guy for three years. God, I can imagine what, what was that like, working with Factory? Oh, it was amazing. Oh, it was fantastic. It was absolutely brilliant. Uh, I, 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 the first record, I, I used to do press, you see. I was, I was, 
the first job I had uh, was at Creation in 1985. Uh, I moved from Plymouth from that record shop. And that was because of that Jesus and Mary Chain gig that I was just mentioning. I put uh-huh. them on. And Alan McGee came down to Plymouth and saw this chaos. On <laughs> and, oh, it was crazy. I mean, you know, it's a very tiny club and, 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 and the, the police weren't happy. You know, this group had a reputation for having riots at their shows, which yeah. was, you know, relatively true. <laughs> I, my, minor scraps and scuffles, which yeah. have been turned into riots via Alan McGee's um, McLaren-esque kind of Man. way of getting publicity. Yeah. But, um, but I, 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 I did the same thing. I told, them, I told the, 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 the morning news and the evening herald that there was a rap blasphemous riot band coming to Plymouth, and of course they put it all over the front pages. No, of course they did. Of course like, they did. I suppose it's, it's like any publicity is good publicity, especially back then. Oh God, yeah. I mean, you know, if I if I hadn't known that group and I read there was a blasphemous riot band coming, I'd have been it. I'd have gone. I'd, yeah. have, I'd have bought a ticket. <laughs> no, no, but then the other thing is also that that it's like when I guess it's around about the time when they started to do like. People would, would, would have started like putting like offensive like, lyrics like warning con- content on the albums, and they they would, like, end up shifting about fifty times the amount that yeah. they had to record with sell because yeah. it was those big oh that's offensive that's still a challenge of parents yeah oh totally so naughty kids just going to have that one <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> you know yeah so but, yeah we were. We, 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 that's how I got that job at Creation, but then I got the job at Factory. We, I mean, I, God, I mean, I, it's mad. I, 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 you know, that, I got a work for Alan McGee and Tony Wilson. Um, they both have the characters, aren't they? Yeah, and they were both quite different characters. Very forceful, strong, passionate people. Um, Tony, you could tell he was Cambridge educated and, and, and quite the intellectual. Alan's more streetwise and um, and uh, tough, really, I think. But you know, Tony would just have a, a very random idea, which um, he would never fail to act on, you know, wow. whether people agreed with him or not, he would go ahead. So I, I like that. I like that free spirit. And, yeah. um, uh, you know, he, he, he always thought he knew better than, than everybody, including the groups, really. Um, which he didn't, but it was, it, it, watching him operate was, was really quite fantastic. Wow. And, and quite inspiring. But back to Bristol though, Mike Chadwick, that guy, yeah, one day after doing this head label with him, with Loop and uh, whatever, we stayed friends and, 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 and oh, he called me once in 1989. Yeah. Out of the blue and said that, um, that Revolver, as it was then, still the distribution, it was before it became Vital Distribution, he said that we, that we, need, a, we, need, an in, you know, we need an in-house label here. There's quite a lot of good stuff around in Bristol at the moment. Mm. And we don't have a label would you like to come in with, on, on this label with me and be the a and and um, I'll do all of the finance stuff and you can go mm. and sign some groups and stuff. So I thought about it for about a, a nanosecond and then said, yes, of course, I would. <laughs> and, uh, Some of you would too. And it's, that, it's like your <laughs> dream job, isn't it? Being handed slap bang right in your lap. Oh, oh yeah. No, I, I was, I, it, was, it was definitely another one of those pinch yourself moments where I was like, okay, Yep, I'm in. Um, and, uh, and that was Mike. Mike actually bailed on it quite quickly because we signed some groups where we, we generated quite a lot of publicity and profile for the first three signings mm. very quickly. St. Etienne, Manic Street yeah. Preachers and Flowered Up. Were, wow. Think, yeah, I mean, everyone was on the front cover of, you know, we had, we had five weekly mu- music papers back then. Enemy, Melody Maker, Sounds, mm. Record Mirror. And Black Echoes, we rarely troubled Black Echoes, but the other papers, we were on the covers with these groups, yeah. you know. I mean, try <laughs> keeping the Manic Street Preachers off the off the, off the cover of any magazine, you know. Yeah. Well, well, it was like, then it's like the same, but then it's like the same at the time with like Synthetian and stuff like that. Because like, mm. obviously, I remember my, I guess, my introduction to Synthetian was been hearing like a lot of bands have been hearing them on the radio. Yeah, so, like they would have played part of like my childhood's kind of soundtrack inadvertently. Because like when Foxtrot um, Alpha came out, I would yeah. have been about eight years old. <laughs> oh wow! Well, yeah. the um, "Only Love Can Break Your Heart" single came out thirty years ago yesterday. Yeah, I know that. That, 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 that is such a great. I didn't realise that was a Neil Young cover until yes, like a few years ago. And then, then, but but what a great 
cover. I think it's, it's a great cover. It down it, not only is it a Neil Young song, it's a Neil Young song that was written and performed in Walt's time. And wow. they just, you know, they, they really did make it their own. Yeah. And I, 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 it was really lovely to hear it yesterday um, on its 30th birthday, uh, release day. Um, I think it's and also, it still sounds really fresh. It still like, sounds young, youthful and fresh and like a great pop record should. Yeah. But I think it's I think it's a testament to the fact that they took that they took that song and they completely reimagined it in their own way and they, mm. they made something really work and really stand out. I mean yeah. like so whenever I hear it, I'm reminded of being like eight years old or yeah. you know, like either like kind of seeing them on top of the parks or yeah. something like that. And people forget about like actually I guess how differently like the media world kind of worked, I guess, mm -hmm. back then. And actually the importance of having things like like radio, even mainstream radio to airplane, that sort of thing. Yeah, definitely. And 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 having that amount of music papers each week, you know, it was uh, it was it was it was it was a good time, you know, it's very healthy to you know, to you know, I, I was a big enemy reader and just I'd wait outside the shop. So I'd be waiting outside the shop for it to open of a Wednesday, as it was in Plymouth when they arrived, and uh, waiting for it to come. But the, the thing about Only Love Can Break Your Heart that I still think is, it, 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 you can hear in the song, is it was made by a couple of guys, a couple of kids who loved pop music, who absolutely yeah. loved it. To actually, to reinterpret something like, you know, fearlessly, you know, because some people are looking, oh man, you can't touch a Neil Young song. Well, not yeah. only did they touch it, but they completely did reimagine it, you know. Um, and they weren't skilled musicians. They were just right. dreamers and believers and, um, and pop kids. Well, I guess it's a bit like, in, in some ways, it, it kind of like, they came out around the same time as like stuff like Stereo Lab as well, which was also like kind of dreaming on like both elements of like and broadcast, where they're taking like kind of, I guess elements of like kind of slightly dance music and then and nerdy indie music and making this kind of like really kind of, I guess encapsulating capturing pop movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know. There's a, a love of movies in there for all of those groups as well, I think, um, and soundtracks and uh, finding influences in film soundtrack. Well, I think that, I think that it's also like it's, it's like you know bringing up stuff like film soundtracks is also like quite a huge kind of influence on a lot of people. Cause yeah, like, I mean, like yeah, Barrow, Portishead. Yeah. You no, know, those film samples. Lalo Schifrin film samples on their first album. Yeah, and then also the other thing which I, I mean, I always get remembered of like kind of like stuff like the like James Bond themes and stuff like that. And just like it's like how I mean, I was talking first with Kate Stables about how like sometimes we hear things and it is and it does have like a sentimental value to us. Mm -hmm. I think that sometimes it's because. Maybe because music can communicate an emotion that we can't always verbalise. Um, so, like, obviously, doing stuff like soundtracks, um, they they can like serve a purpose to, to like semi narrate what's happening in the film. Yeah. Or how the audience is supposed to feel. Sorry. Yeah. So, what do we do then? Do we do we then do do we then use other people's music to to soundtrack our film? So it's our yeah. lives. I've been constantly soundtracked. I think by, yeah. uh, so I think, yeah. I think that from like even from like pre birth, there's things like obviously we hear like a man sing voices sort of thing. Uh -huh. And that actually, you know, like yeah. when even when you go outside, there's always noise going on. There's always, you know, like either animals. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's just so like, to screen this guy. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. To be honest, I think I think that's one of the things which actually, which I have enjoyed about some of the live streams, has been some of the either some of the pet, some of the pet interaction or some of the get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Every time but no, but, <laughs> he wants but his own show, Jeff. Yeah, but some of the some of the but some of like the, the some of the interactions have been like really made some of the live streams for me. Right. Like, like you know, a sea change. I was watching um, what was it? Uh, dry cleaning. Mm -hmm. They, they pre-recorded like a performance, and they, they're all in their individual houses. Mm -hmm. And uh, the bass player, halfway through, like the they did two songs, and halfway through the second song, the bass player's puppy literally coming inside to do bass, and he literally had to like yeah. whilst playing the song, shoo the puppy <laughs> away. 
<laughs> you know, like to like, when we would sort of be like, to the shoot the puppy with one hand, I was still saying take the best with the other. <laughs> Brilliant. Or like, um, I was watching, was it uh, Young Knives? I've been doing yeah. like a regular stream, and okay. um, they they had one night. I think it was like one of them. One of them's like living in a in a caravan, and he decided to dress up as uh, Ron Mail from Sparks. Mm-hmm. And then the, the other guy, um, they they were playing like lots of really random seventies and eighties adverts in between each one of their songs. Yeah. And then like mm-hmm. the other one had his eleven year old son controlling the back band visuals, <laughs> and like every now and again. His son would like kind of pop in and like basically kind of he'd like cross up like cross between Jason Voorhees meets Ronald McDonald. All I can give you all I can give you is a cat, Jeff. Sorry, man. That's the best interaction I've had so far, to be honest. <laughs> Great. You can stay there, okay? <laughs> well, no, let's face it. Let's face it. It's like sometimes it's the random interactions which make things a lot more interesting. That's life, Jeff. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's so true. It's I mean, definitely like, true. I mean, I've also found that um, through this period, I found myself actually reflecting on a lot more things and actually seeing either um, for me how far emotionally I've come. Like, all like how far, like, I never ever thought that for, for me, even sitting down doing this is like something that, that I'll never be able to do even four, four or five years ago. Partly it's not having technology, but then also partly because of, I think, confidence wise. Okay. Well, that's good to, that's good to hear. I mean, I mean, I, I, it's great that you're doing it. I mean, I, I, it doesn't surprise me though. I mean, yeah. you've always, you've always been, uh, you, you, whenever I've spoken to you, you always speak brilliantly, eloquently, passionately, and, and knowledgeably about everything. Um, so this is right that you're doing this, you know. I mean, yeah. you've always been curious. You're always down, you know. You 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 you, you as, always at gigs, always getting involved. Mm. You know. I mean, that's all it takes, Jeff. A bit of confidence and a lot of passion, really. Yeah. You know? Just. Uh, you should keep doing this. I think, really. You oh, know, no, even, yeah. even, well, even when we're all allowed out, you should be. Um, you should be chatting to people. Uh, well, I, I always, well, I kind of always have been, but the thing is, like, sometimes in certain situations, I guess it's like, like I've seen, like we'd, we'd be seeing each other at like Sea Change Festival, mm-hmm. for instance, and but then sometimes it'd be like, oh, quick, I've got to go, go and nip off to go and see this person. Yeah. Whereas actually, <laughs> sit down and actually have a one-to-one chat is <laughs> is actually it reminds me like that. There's so much more to kind of humanity than we probably take for granted. Yeah. You know, and I we think we rush around a bit, don't we? Yeah. There's yeah. also like um, books that I've always found that I've got to go to certain shows on on because of like certain emotional, you know, like emotional feelings. And I actually have to say that um, I remember one was End of the Road where B1 played. Yeah. And I just remember that, I mean, thanks, I think it was, I mean, like, I just remember, like, kind of spending half their performance with my eyes shut and then wet, opening mm. my eyes and being confronted by bees. Yeah, <laughs> it was beautiful, that, wasn't it? It was, oh, man, it was a Sunday, amazing. early Sunday. They, they're making, a, they've been making a new record for a little while. Um, oh, wow. It would have been, I think it would have been completed by now, but um, they were in the final final straight just before before everything ground to a a lockdown halt um mm. but hopefully yeah that, in fact they were even supposed to be doing a couple of shows they had uh wow uh, yeah they had a show lined up at the king's place in london for july uh and something else in august but sadly like everything else has been persp- cancelled or postponed yeah I mean, that was lovely wasn't it that was on the, if a Am I right in remembering that it was on the garden stage? Yeah, it uh, was. I remember that. I remember it's ten thirty in the morning. I think it was. Uh, yeah. I think it was the year yeah. when. Um, I think the teen, I think teenage fan club played that year. I think it uh-huh. was. Um, I think it was partly because of like the headline that they had on the Sunday night, because she was like a harpist. Um, the Joanna Newsom uh-huh. thing. 
So they couldn't have anything clashing with her? That's right. Yeah. And that, and that, uh, they had to turn all the other everything off, didn't they? All the yeah. music had to be turned off. I was stood in the I was stood in the rough trade tent opposite yeah. the uh, the rough trade shop opposite the rough uh, opposite the um, uh, the tent where Teenage Fan Club were playing, and yeah. in that shop, um, they had some music playing. And somebody came in and asked them to even turn that off in the, yeah. in the shop. Well, well, a giant I, I, I can tell you this: I can tell them I understand synthesizers because the harp is quite a delicate instrument mm -hmm. to be playing. But yeah, I did it was very odd. I did a little bit could have get under my goat. I think it was also that it was also heavily could have quite heavily raining at the time. Yeah, or something like that. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, what else? I guess it's probably me just going like we usually. I guess like with treating sometimes festivals is like you need to put them into fast food. Like mm -hmm. quick, I'm going to go from this experience to this experience. <laughs> did you watch Teenage Fan Club that night? Yeah, I did. Um, I remember watching. So I think that would have been like was that about 2016? Because mm -hmm. I think was that the same year that you had the 25th anniversary? Is that? That was 2015. I think it was the year. I think you're right that it was the year after that. I yeah. think you're right. It was. I think it was 16. I think you're co correct there. We did the garden stage all day on the Saturday. Yeah. In 2015, and, and Saint Etienne played, didn't they? And Lanigan played. Yeah. I remember Saint Etienne set. That, that was absolutely stunning. That was great. I remember, like, with the heat, with the heat, so like inflatable balls. Yeah, that's right. And oh, that was really good. Yeah. That was really good. And Stealing Sheep played a really good show that day. Yep. And Hooten Tennis Club. Yeah. Did Bill Ryder play that day? Was that? Who, who, Jeff? Sorry. Bill Ryder play then? Or was that? Um, was that? I can't, I can't remember. I can't remember. Uh, fair enough. To be honest, you've got so much stuff. I know. It gives me a brainache. It's like honestly, I've been thinking this whole thirtieth birthday thing. People have been trying to talk to me about it. I'm thinking bloody hell. Yeah. I, I have to, <laughs> I have to kind of, I'm very, I'm very much, I'm very much a tomorrow person. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it's, you know, I, 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 I don't always think the the best is yet to come, but I just, I just, I'm always, you know, I, 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 I love the momentum that you get with this. And it's, awesome. it goes back, it goes back to that thing I was saying earlier about that desire to hear something first. It's just, you know, to create, to be part of the, you know, to be assist in the creation of, of getting music out is such a blessing and a pleasure that um, that it's all that the thrust is always that. So thinking back sometimes it's very very hard to remember. Well, it's, well, it's like for me it's like um, I guess it's like discovering when you discover something for the first time you, you always you always have like a wave of energy. Mm -hmm. So like so I've, I've always remember like sometimes things like discovering young fathers for the first time when like I literally physically couldn't sleep afterwards because I, I had. Wow. That much excitement and energy yeah. afterwards, or like, um, cause if, cause sometimes I've seen artists when they've done something completely brand new, like someone like Anna Meredith, for instance, who yeah. like crosses like in the multiple genres mm. within one song, and I'll find myself like ha having like an on button which doesn't really go off. Mm. It might, I mean, I'll probably have to like sometimes give myself like a good three or four hours to calm down afterwards. <laughs> Staff, isn't it? <laughs> so, to be honest, I think, I think that, like, well, it's like sometimes, like, like with some festivals, I found myself actually getting so excited that, that I haven't been able to physically sleep. <laughs> you know, like, I'll be like, because uh, you, you lost your tent. <laughs> no, I think it's, I think it's more that I have, it's, it's a really weird thing that it's like, it's almost like a FOMO sort of thing. Where, so I have to be at the very first yeah. thing. I have to be at the very last thing. Yeah. I have to like sometimes, even if it includes like kind of going to bed at five in the morning to be waking up at like kind of ten in the morning to go and see the very very first thing. I have to do that. Yeah. Even yeah. At, from even in Barcelona from a very sound, I'll be like kind of getting back to my apartment say six o'clock in the morning, crashing out for a few hours, yeah. then like for a couple of hours later I'll be like. Right, uh oh, first band starting, it'd be like ten o'clock in the morning sort of thing. So I'll be like right up power then then I'll be out right in the centre of Barcelona to watch a lot of the preamble stuff which happens before the main festival yeah. event. Yeah. So I will literally probably 
I thought we could probably quite easily see about 20 or 30 hacks in a day. Jeez, wow, man. I hope you never lose that enthusiasm, Jeff. <laughs> uh, I think I will, because I think if, as, as long as there's still people making new music out there, I think there's always going to be something new to discover. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, it, there, there is. It's, there will be. There will, there, there will be forever and ever and ever. It's like the whole thing. And, and then there's this whole, the whole, there's, 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 there's a whole pa bunch of stuff in the past that we don't even know about yet as well. Oh, yeah. You know? that's, that's why I love like ruffling through um, charity shops sometimes. Mm. It's because yeah. like you will uh, occasionally stumble across like the records. You go, the, the, well, it'll either be this will be genius, or yeah. it'll be so offensively bad. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that someone you know ever like you know licensed this. Like yeah. hearing about Mrs. Mills making her psychedelic records, sort of thing. Yeah. Apparently she did make like a like a she did try to do like a psychedelic covers album. <laughs> I'm not sure if I want to hear if I if I have to hear that or I really don't want to hear that. <laughs> um, he I says find it going on to discogs. Yeah, well, I, I, um, I saw was it uh, Cello Biafra was doing the like a like a thing online where he's like talking about his his record collection and he he pulled it out and it's like Hair with like this lime green sleeve and other things to like green, green colours. I think it's apparently eating some soap cookies or something. You know. Oh, yeah. Just uh, uh, Jeff, just, just give me just one second. I just need to get a glass of water a minute. I just okay. drank this bottle of. I've got a glass of the bag too. Wendy, Wendy wants to say hello, Jeff. Hi, hey, Wendy. <laughs> How you doing? Really nice to see you. How's things? Yeah, I'm holding on, alright. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm like, I'm still alive, you know. Hey. Like, despite, despite kind of like, then calling to bed about three o'clock in the morning, you know. Oh, it's really nice to see you, Jeff. Yeah, let's see you, too, like Wendy. That. Take yeah. care, yourself. Yeah. Uh, so that's been the nice thing for this uh, lockdown. I've been locked down with Wendy. I've been locked down with Wendy and Sunny, my um, our oldest, and um, yeah. and uh, and that's been that's been that's been great. That's and been I guess really it's good. Like kind of bringing home like to the family and like the importance yeah. to me as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah, been, I must admit that, that's one thing I've been missing because like because my parents live down in Bur in Plymouth and like. Yeah. What part of Plymouth are they in, Jeff? Um, they live in they live in Stonehall Flats. Okay. Right, and yeah. then like um, my sister literally lives that, like down the road from them. Okay. Um, is that is that stone is that Stonehouse near yeah. the, where the Kreml, where the ferry is the Kremlin yeah. ferry? Yeah. That's lovely, that ferry. It goes across to Mount Edgecombe, doesn't it? Oh, man, we've, we've done that so many times for walks. I love that. It's perfect. Because also, yeah. like, my parents are really into sailing, quite into sailing. Okay, perfect. It's, then. Yeah, so they've, they've, so, where, so where they are, they've got, like, their own kind of key. Okay, I think, right. Like, so, like, pretty much right outside their flat. Oh, nice. Great. Right, so right next door to Princess Yachts. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, I, I, I know. I know yeah, that. I mean, so that's um, that's really close to the actual Cremel Ferry slipway, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. About a five minute walk away. We used to go over to Edgecombe quite a lot when I lived there. Um, I, I lived in Plymouth from eight, eighty to eighty five, um, January January eighty to June eighty five, but with a year off in Bristol. Um, and uh, my brother lives in Stonehouse actually, and my big brother I, I used to live with, and. Wow. Um, and yeah, as soon as the sun came out, we'd be on that ferry going over to Edgecombe, oh, or we'd go jump in a car and go to Whitsam Bay, mm. spend the afternoon on the beach. It's but then like, the thing is, but, but then it's like, um, I mean, I've, I've been, I've, I guess I've been like, kind of, because I look back to my parents, and I guess that they, 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 they also both like kind of influenced me in this have been the way, not just like outlook of the mind, but also how I listen to things as well. Right. I think that. Um, like for instance, like so, a lot of like, um, um, a lot of like sometimes my relationship with music was sometimes built around car journeys, and yeah. um, like cassette tapes sort of thing. Do you remember what you were listening to? What they were playing? Oh yeah, some of them. So, so, so some of them I do. Like um, I remember that one of my favourites um, was a like kind of seventies um, hip hop disco mixtape made for them by their best man. 
Okay, great. Oh yeah, so it's so so it's like so it's from the age of about five I was introduced to like Grace Jones, Mally Mel with Furious Five, Grandmaster Flash, Africa Babata. Whether I knew actually who they were, uh-huh. you know, I'd find out I'd find out later sort of thing in my life if I've been yeah. who these people what these artists' names were, but I'd hear these songs and be like, Wow, these sounds like space aliens. Yeah. You know, with, with all the synth sounds sort of thing. Yeah, they're all they're they're all really good. They're, I mean, those those examples are fantastic, aren't they? And and yeah. and odd, and all just brilliantly, brilliantly, brilliantly odd and great. <laughs> yeah, you can still stick them on, and they'll fill any dance floor. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, like, totally, yeah. You know, like whether it's like Grace Jones. I mean, Gra- I mean, I've seen Grace Jones a few times, and she's always been a like kind of quite an incredible diva performer. Mm. I mean, like. If you want anyone to put Madonna to shame, just yeah. just, just stick on Grace Jones. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's like she's seventy something years old and she's still like wearing virtually nothing on stage. Yeah, no, no. Most, most of her costume is body paint. <laughs> you like her watching it. <laughs> My a friend of mine plays guitar in her in her live group, has done for quite a long time. Yeah. And uh absolutely loves her, but just you know, it it it, it Amazes him still to this day that she she just hasn't really aged. She just no. hasn't aged. You know, she would still go out with the same energy um, level yeah. and uh, commitment to the performance and the show, and enjoy herself. Oh it's yeah, such... well, it's, it's, her sense of humour is freaking brilliant. Yeah, like, it's like, well, who else could you think of who would perform with a, with a massive strap on and just say to him, "Like, hi, <laughs> shoot your eyes, kids," <laughs> and like, you know, and they're like all like. I remember, like, uh, Stan and Cooling, she was like one of the headliners, and she, she, she basically like go, she was like kind of backstage, and she's like, "I'm going to do a new song now. I think this one sounds slightly Irish." I was like, "Really? Which part of it?" <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, it's like, really, Grace? Which part of it?" <laughs> was it no Irish at all? Yeah, exactly. Of course, it wasn't. <laughs> It was, it, was, it was Grace Jones doing like ridiculous things as for always. Ah, or like, you know, like she'd be up from a various hand and she'd be like, right, this is what I used to wear to go to school in. Really? <laughs> oh, man. So are you looking forward to the day we can get back into the gigs? Uh, or yeah. have you got any concerns about being in crowds? I suppose it's all going to happen. When it happens, I, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's going to be an interesting to see actually how mm-hmm. we can, you know, kind of make shows, um, yeah. you know, socially distanced. I mean, one of the ideas I, I couldn't have thought of was um, obviously doing virtual reality gigs is going to be, is going to be kind of quite an interesting mm-hmm. uh, kind of concept, but I don't think it's going to quite work. But I also thought about another way, or like more Wi Fi way, which people could get more involved in shows, is if we. Set, like set up a load of easels in the venues, and then we yeah. can like get everyone to draw the band to actually draw the bands. Okay. <laughs> but then you can still have the two meters distancing. Yeah. You put everyone like in a down in the seat or thing, uh-huh. almost having them surround the performers. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that should be a shout out to which band wants to be the first to let that to be in that situation. Yeah. Well, I've done, well I've, I mean, I've done it myself. To Any bands people. watching this now? That's the yeah. call. So that's yeah, the call exactly. Well, 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 we'll be watching it. Well, we'll be watching it when it comes out on Thursday. But you know, um, <laughs> that's but, a good idea. But yeah, so I find myself that sometimes when I've been drawing it shows that sometimes it, it it kind of intensifies the experience, right? Or like it makes you kind of have a greater focus on things. Mm-hmm. Um, is what I found. It's also great to like um, I can find myself. Like kind of being down the front of really, really lively shows, yeah. watching all the bodies flying around me, and just like kind of, <laughs> with a massive grin on, with a massive grin on my face. <laughs> with, with the out, just like kind of doing like a scrawl suddenly, that carefully yeah. drawn face of the scrawl. Yeah, literally <laughs> like I did. Um, I think I did. I did JPEG. I drew. I drew. I was drawing at the JPEG Mafia show at the Exchange last year. Right. That was like. I think he lasted about. 10 seconds on stage before he literally dived up. Mm. I think it was like every, it was like almost like 
For every 10 seconds he's on stage, he'd spend at least 20 seconds on top of the audience. <laughs> Great. Have you drawn any of our lot? Any of the heavenly lot? Have you yeah, drawn Dave Azuga? Have you done Katie? Yeah. Yeah, Katie's, uh, Katie's definitely seen because she's been... She was supporting Fiction Work to, to the quite a few people. So I've, I've, I've always, whenever she's either that or like Lazarus Kane or any of those lot, really, whenever they turned up, I've been like, I've drawn them. I've, been, I've done Working Men's Club a couple of times. Have you? Have you yeah. drawn them? Okay. I've drawn, I've, I need, I'll need to dig them out. Yeah, please. Somewhere. Yeah, I'd like to see them. Yeah. Um, and I've got, like, um, who else have I done from your lot? I'm just trying to think. Right now, seeing pictures of my lot drawn is the next best that by you is the next best thing to actually see in a gig, I think. Really? <laughs> I suppose it's best to get some of the blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> oh, there's some there's something new from um, Working Men's Club um, appearing next week, actually. So oh, wow. if this goes out, when does this go out, Jeff? Thursday. Yeah. Um, on Friday. So next Friday was the original release date of their um, album. Yeah. Uh, which June the fifth we were supposed to be putting the album out, and we had we we we, we decided to move it back to October, yeah, because we thought there might be gigs in October or September, October. Um, uh, but we did decide to create something new to mm. put out that day anyway. So yeah. it's a little bit hush hush, but you'll start seeing clues drop from yeah. Monday. Um, uh, it's very good. I guess it also makes me think about, like, you know, like, with obviously, like, with, with putting out releases at the moment, like, how, how is it going to affect, you know, sort of, like, I guess the market, I guess, you know, people buying records because of, like, I guess it would mostly kind of go to people who are, like, buying online. Yeah, I, I, it's the live side that I really worry about, to be honest with yeah. you. Um, I, I mean, sales are... The shops are the shops are busy. The shops that were the shops that were ready for mail order. The shops that already had mail order or were quick to adapt yeah. are okay. I mean, they're finding it incredibly hard work because there's, there's of obviously fewer, fewer of them because of the social distancing. It's not a full crew. Right. Um, but luckily, we're you know, people, my friends and, and the shops that I, I'm in contact with, they're all reporting good sales yeah. um, and, and healthy business. And we've seen, you know, sort of spiking, spiked, spiking streaming. Um, yeah. Radio is radio listenership on up six music listenerships up twenty percent or so. Um, so people are listening. Yeah. But it's just you know the the, the, you know, the live side of it is so fragile, I guess. Oh, so fragile. And you know, you think about groups like you know the Orioles who are doing you know yeah. they're doing fine the Orioles are okay but man yeah. they just started to make a bit of money from shows yeah you know and then you know the summer festival run and an October tour all yeah kinds of, and I, and I, and you know also, like, those, 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 those like, kids you know it's yeah. hard I guess they, it's just like because like we don't always think about like the amount it either costs the artists or even like like promoters as well Oh, the, the whole system, the whole network, the whole system. We we have a very good relationship uh, uh, with a, a venue in Yorkshire called the, uh, the Trades Club in uh, oh, that's Bridge. Venue. That's it's a, beautiful... a great venue. Every everything about that venue is just it's just fantastic. The lovely people that run it, the way it's ran, the way it's looked after, the mm. care and attention to the sound and the and yeah. and, 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 and the comfort of of, of, of everybody, and the fact that they book so adventurously in such yeah. a small town. You know, and the way they look after people, and people keep going back. It's testament to how well that's ran. But man, it, it's bloody. It, you know, it's it's scary yeah. where that's at right now. You know, it, 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 there's only so many times you feel that you can kind of you know pass the hat around for some change. You know, yeah. so I, I, I really I, it upsets me. You know that that's uh, that that place. I think, I think you know, it's also what, like. It's, 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 it's almost like if it's like a kind of like an anti-party part of our society. That something that we, we may be taking, that some of us, you know, may be taking for granted. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I guess. I mean, this well, has maybe, been maybe, one of the... Maybe that's like, I'm not talking about like you and me, I'm talking about like maybe other people. Yeah. 
I think so. I, I, I think you're probably right. I think, um, I think you're probably right. I think that a lot of people have, you'd like to think that people have actually sort of stopped and realised that, that this is important. And, mm. and if they have been able to chuck in a couple of quid to help it along, then that, 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 that's obviously fantastic. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's the venues, it's the promoters, it's, it's the bar staff, it's the printer mm. who makes the posters, it's every... Sound engineers and like the kind of... <sighs> and then the crew that work with the bands. Oh, yeah. my God. You I know. know. <laughs> I know, dude. I, I feel your pain. It's then, really, it's really, it's it's really, it's really grim. And that's a whole summer wiped out for everybody as well this year, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, God, we're not, we're not going to look back too well, far. Every single, all the festivals. I mean, the whole events industry. I think the thing is, like, it's partly because we're living through something that it's not just taking this country; it's taking pretty much the world, mm. sort of thing. And that. No. 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 Um, totally, but the small the, the small venues trust are doing doing a good job. I think I think they're um, that that they the way they've been they've been lobbying government for, for for funding and making sure that people realise how important it is. Well, no, it's also uh, like I don't trust that bloody culture minister of ours right now. But anyway, no, <laughs> I don't think I trust any of those. Any of... Uh, but you look at that guy and I think, really, who's culture? <laughs> yeah, know, exactly. I, I, don't, I don't go to the opera, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then the thing is, is that I think that that I mean, it's like I mean, like I thank my lucky stars for places like the Louisiana and like I'll say yeah. the Exchange and like well, mm. also, even though like even before the Exchange, the Croft because it's pretty much the same people who run right. who run both those places because of it gave me I guess access to the bands, but then also yeah. access to safe spaces as well. Yeah, because especially like I noticed that with. Especially with the Croft, with Stokes Croft at the time was quite a dang, it was quite a rough and dangerous area. Right. And I noticed that. I think the, I noticed the area change over time. I think, but but partly I think it would have been sparked off of venues like the Croft, as if and having people something for people to go into where they could feel safe. Right. Mm. I, mean, like, I don't think I've I don't think I've been there. Is it is it still open, Stokes Croft venue? Um, it's it's well. They kind of they sold it to the people who turned it into the Crofters' rights. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, um, so it's it's a bit different. It's still got some of the some some of the similarities, but they okay. completely changed the the insides of it, sort of thing. Right, right. Um, but then, like, the, but then I said, like, like Paul Horlick and Matt Ottridge, who are like the main owners of the Croft, they basically mm -hmm. they also opened up the exchange. Yeah, okay. and yeah and the thing that, that what, what the exchange has done so brilliantly is that they, they've really opened them up, up for like outsider communities right. so there's a lot, a lot of people like from either LGBT or yeah. like people from like um, communities which aren't always really recognised and they'll, they'll, they'll allow them to put on nights and put on okay. you know, different events sort of thing and that's the uh, I guess that's what I really miss out on is actually the communities yeah. surrounding yeah. the surrounding the shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 good. I guess if you go out as regularly as you do, you get to see so many different people. People coming mm. through town, yeah. coming through town every time. So it's good seeing a lot of different faces. That, that that that's a good thing, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that and I think that's what's helped me is basically as mm. been. As I said, it would be like I'd turn up regularly to the Louisiana. They used to have mm. the same doorman kind of quite a lot of the time. And it's through seeing regular faces mm. that kind of like that actually helped me in more ways than one because it was like establishing friendships, but then also it was like helping open me up. Yeah. Because I used to be a very like kind of closed off, almost like fishbowl y type person. Whereas now I see it's like the fishbowl's got a lot, lot, lot bigger. Yeah. Still a yeah. bit like that now, but I mean, like, as if in, like, they helped me a lot with my mental health and with, okay. like, kind of, I guess, talking about things, really. Great. That's One good. of the first people I actually opened up to was, like, a guy called Johnny Barrage. He used to be, like, one of the main doormen for the Louisiana. Oh, okay. Sort of thing. Just because I felt like I could, like, could have trust in them. Right. Oh, that's really good. Where, whereabouts is the exchange, Jeff? I don't think I know it. It's uh, like the bottom of Old Market. It's right, like, okay. If you were to go 
I kind of, it's like right next door to the pub with the stag and hounds, like opposite oh, yeah. side of the same building. Yeah. Okay. Sort of thing. But yeah, yeah, yeah. they, I mean, yeah, they, I think they, they, they've always been really active in community. So they're, they're like one of the first venues in Bristol to be actually community owned. So they, they, that's how they, I think that's how they're surviving. I mean, like, I'm actually midway through designing a t-shirt for them. Uh-huh. You know, it's like, I, because like, if the Louisiana wanted me to design a t-shirt, I'd definitely design, I'd design every venue a t-shirt if they wanted me. Right. Whether it's places I've been to, whether it's places I haven't been to, because I feel, yeah. I feel that, you know, like I, you know, I did like a tour for Independent Venue Week and I felt like a kid on Godstoppers the entire time. Yeah. About yeah, because I was being shown around like places like like the lead mill. I'd never been to the lead mill, and I got taken oh. on a historic tour. And I was like, wow! I could, I, I, could, yeah. I was almost like they were showing me like the original pulp posts, and I could virtually barely even breathe. I was like, too much, <laughs> like, too much yeah. fanboying. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a really great venue. A lot of heritage there. Yeah, and like even like the trades club as well. I was like, kind of, I remember looking like walking in there or walking into the main room and just staring at the ceiling and start going wow yeah this, you know you can there's a feeling of real there's a feeling of that that word safe that you you, you use which is very important that that, that that to to go somewhere and feel safe that's instant at the trades i think mm. you know there's something about there's a warmth to that venue where you do feel it and then you see mel the promoter or sarah the volunteer yeah and I must you admit, know you know you were in a safe. Well, I must admit, I didn't meet Mal because I was, uh, I was, I think he was ill at the time. But like, he was, wasn't he? Earlier this year, he was, he was under the weather. We'd be good. To, we'd be pleased to know he's much better. In fact, oh, I wow. think he would actually say that he's totally back. He, he, yeah, he got, he got knocked out by a, a peculiar illness, but he's, he's, he's on the mend. The only thing that's bothering him now is the, the, the security of the venue. You know, the, yeah. the safety of the venue. But he's in, he's in good, he's in good health. Excuse me, one second. Can I have a cookie? Um, uh, but yeah, um, did Tom Friend mention anything to you about his plans that he, he was having for a friendly festival over in um, South Yes. Yeah, because I know that he was doing something with, with Connell, with Connell Dodds. That's right, yeah, with Connell. Yeah. I guess that's, I guess that's 2021 now, like uh, yeah. <laughs> everything else. Yeah, um, I, I, think that's, I think that's a great idea, because I think there's definitely an area of Bristol which feels a lot less explored. Right, yeah. so the there's, there's not so much going on, whereas most of the events which happen in Bristol either happen right in the centre or they'll happen in like the Stokes Croft area, mm-hmm. which are seen as like the party hubs. Mm-hmm. Whereas, I guess I think South Bristol is, um, is definitely under you know undernourished in that so in that in that kind of that kind of you know sense, you know as if in like. Um, like, so there's, there's not really that many that many Bristols, that many venues apart from like the Louisiana, the, the Fiddlers, and um, the other pubs around the corner from me, which is not really that, for, for, for the size of, of Bristol, we need to have mm. like, more spaces, I think. Is the Thekla still operating? Um, obviously, they're on lockdown at the moment, but... Yeah. yeah, in general, though, I, 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 they clo- I, did they close the, the, for a while for a refurbishment or something? Or yeah, they, they do that every few years. They right. have to keep it seaworthy. Yes, of course. Like, yeah, yeah. So like every few, every. I mean, God, that must cost them a lot of money. Yeah. Well, we we were involved in in, in that for a while. It was it, it, it was it was actually a Thekla social for a while. Um, yeah. Me and my partners at the social in the social. Uh, we went into we we we, we so DHP own it and yeah. um, and we had the social in Nottingham and our original partner um, uh, didn't want to continue and sold hit sold the lease to mm. DHP so we went in with them for a while so that was a social there yeah. and during that time we we we, we collectively went onto the Thekla yeah. but. DHB, yeah, and it was a mess. It was a wreck. It was really yeah. did need a, it needed service, a lot of servicing, and refurbishing. And uh, DHP, to their credit, yeah. spent an awful lot of money renovating it and putting a fantastic PA in. I yeah, mean, it no, was, exactly. It was good. I, I was up in London, and my uh, the first few bands we 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 had booked there. I can't remember who it was now, but there were people I knew, 
and every one of them, the tour manager was getting back to me going, that is a great venue. The sound's yeah. fantastic. The facilities are fantastic. Um, sadly, uh, a year later, uh, George had failed to recoup hardly any of his money that he'd invested and, um, right. and therefore our partnership um, uh, collapsed because of uh, lack of funds. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see that they've kept it on because it's not an easy, it's not right. an easy venue. It's a bloody boat in the middle of a city. I mean, I know, exactly. it's, it's, it's an iconic boat. Yes, it be bad. I mean, like, it was, it's, it's, well, especially to, it's, it was made famous by by the Banksy, um, like the artwork on the side of it, which they've had to remove and actually set it up in Bristol Museum at the moment. Since they, Is it? Yeah, because everything, every, so they had to take it off, take the panel off because it was causing rust. All ah, right, right. And so, like. But yeah, if you think about it, if you're gonna if you're gonna like store somewhere safe and, and have it on public view, first, like somewhere like a museum is perfect for it, really. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. It's like an educational space as well. Definitely, yeah, definitely. Well, I'm looking forward to coming down to Bristol as soon as I can. That will be one of my first stops, I think. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing you but as soon as I can. You know, well, I'll, 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 I'll come see you. God knows whether it'll be a gig or whether it'll just be a passing through, but um, yeah. but hopefully it'll be soon. We'll probably all be nerding out at Friendly Records. Yeah, well that's a good. I, God, I can't wait for that day. I can't yeah. wait for that day to nerd out at Friendly Records. That'd that's really what I miss cool. out is actually is actually being able to hang out in some of these places, even mm. cafes and record shops. Yeah, and actually that I think that they should be added to like for me safe spaces. Yeah, I mean like. God, God knows how my parents brought up with me, especially like walking past record shops where, where I'd literally have to spend like three or four hours like yeah. in there, kind of, like going through like pretty much yeah. almost every single category. <laughs> <laughs> I, think my, I, think, I think my parents, like, they, they, they could have realised early on that, 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 that they'll be safe blacked in these, in these kind of places. Mm. They, know, they know exactly where they find me. <laughs> it needs to be like alphabet. It needs to be like it's like, and then sometimes I remember that. But sometimes it also helped me out with mathematics. Inadvertently. Okay. Like, yeah. Like yeah. If I buy yeah. this record, I can afford this record. If yeah. I buy, <laughs> if I buy, you know. <laughs> I think that it's, it's sort of quite a funny way of thinking about it, but it's partly true. It's partly true. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Parents have Absolutely. sent me out sometimes to Gloucester to go and get some stationery. I go to W H Smiths. I'll be like, and I'm like, right, I could spend like three or four quid on this pen. Oh look, I could go and get a cassette that I can help from over there for like for like less than a fiver. <laughs> yep, yeah. that quid in. <laughs> and then sometimes I turn have to subject my parents to whatever, whatever, whatever I bought basically. And then, so we, I, I always be like, I guess, and then I quite know how to put it into words. But I'd like kind of, I, I, I sometimes had complete control over the, over the car stereo. Mm. So I'd be like, um, then sometimes I, they play stuff like Annie Lennox and stuff like, and he's actually still one of my heroes I've yet to see is Annie Lennox. Okay, yeah. I, I think partly because of, um, I think it's partly the nostalgia thing for me. Mm. So like, I remember like being played stuff like Walking on Broken Glass and like yeah. kind of, um, my little bird when I was like about ten years old, yeah. and I think that I've been lucky that I've t ticked off most of my heroes, you know. Um, so I've ticked yeah. off did, like. Did she perform? I don't think she performs much anymore, does she? No, I don't think she does. I think she does like every now and again, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like, I mean, like, so I've been lucky to see stuff like Mavis Staples, because mm -hmm. um, like my mum was also kind of really into her soul. She. Um, yeah, she was really. Well, she's like she. She likes all the stuff like Aretha Franklin. Um, we got um, play it was. Did she play? They play like some, some sort of gospel, kind of African music. Um, he would mix. Yeah. Um, Good taste, your parents. Yeah, Beatles, Stevie Wonder. Um, but yeah, yeah, basically, I think I think they did actually influence probably the way which I listen to things. I think they did. I think that. I think that you do take certain influence from, from your parents, sort of thing, and you kind of yeah. 
musically, I, musically I, the only influence I got from my parents was to actually actually go and listen to some music because they didn't. Yeah. <laughs> really. no, also, there was none in our house. But I think also the fact that also having her, my parents worked in a quite culturally open sort of thing, so it'd be like, mm. right, I think that's definitely had an impact on me. So I guess that, that when I was a teenager, I was like going through my angry rock period, so it'd be like, right, I'm going to listen to a band which fuses all these songs of music together. <laughs> so like I was, I was like really into like Dub War, um, Bully Rag, um, Asian Dub Foundation, um, who else was I into when I was in my late teenage years? I, was, I guess I was into like some of the like kind of crossover rock kind of stuff. Yeah. So it can it, it still like express my range, but then also have, you can have like some of the local phones of like hip hop and stuff like that. Yeah. Kind of thrown together. Um, and I guess that, yeah, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to really, but. <laughs> just, just go with it. <laughs> I'm going to have to leave you to it, Jeff. I'm afraid yeah. I need to uh, go and do a little bit of work, but it's lovely to talk to you. Lovely to, see, lovely to talk to you too, Jeff. I'm glad to see you're well. If you yeah, speak to or see any of my fr Bristolian friends, give them my best and tell them we'll be meeting up lovely. in Friendly Records as soon as we possibly can. Yeah, man. Love to see you, Jeff. You too, Jeff. Yeah, up, buddy. Yeah, you too, Take mate. Care, All the best. See you later. Yeah, yes, bye. Bye. bye.